knowledge, one of whom is here, and that's Noah Mamak, Associate Producer on the
to the public because physicians and genetic counselors don't have the time or the bandwidth to explain from the beginning how much we've learned over the last 20 to 30 years, how much more complicated things are and how much more uncertain they are. So this is exactly the kind of thing that can help um, people just being wiser, more nuanced consumers of what is going to be kind of a tsunami of products, mm -hmm. if not a tsunami of successes. Well, you know, you, you both have touched on something that I thought a lot about while I was making this project, which is the intersection between hype and hope, because um, I think both are, at least to me, obviously present here. I don't know if either of you wants to address that. I'll Shall just we just share the two for the three? Okay. Um, I thought that this, that this showed very legitimate areas of hope. And if I were going to classify them, this is going to the, this kind of research is likely to be extremely important for people with rare diseases or with single gene disorders or small sets of, of um, genes that are involved. It's also likely to be thrilling around pharmacogenomics, which you don't show here, but is another area where it's very likely that as we learn more about um, genetic variants, we'll be able to uh, align medicines. For, for those variations in a, in a much more careful way. And the third area you did talk about, the first um, approved gene transfer for a, a, a refractory pediatric cancer, a, a, a childhood leukemia. And that is a new um, breakthrough that I think would be, have enormous com um, implications for cancer research. They take the, um, in this case, the child's T cells out and then genetically modify those T cells so that they can attack the specific kind of cancer. And it's strength. so their strength is an immunotherapy and, a, and a, a gene therapy and a cell therapy all in one. And I think those are areas where um, I, I would say that the enthusiasm and the thrill is really warranted. Where it's not, let me give a little um, shout out to <coughs> Nigel Hanna. So he was the epidemiologist that we all saw. So I just want to unpack a little bit of what he was saying, because I think he was terrific and he's right. The hype comes from thinking that we're going that the genetic predictors, learning the genetic predictors of disease is going to help us um, with population health. The, the genomics story it can I think cannot deliver on population level health. So even if we first of all look, uh, I think Francis Collins mentioned how many more. Um, genes are involved with diabetes than, than we thought. What did he say? ADH, right. right. So, and every single gene just is providing a tiny little bit of uh, contribution to whether or not you get diabetes. The overwhelming reason that we get diabetes has to do with social and environmental reasons, not genetic reasons. And so what's dangerous here is that a, the Precision Medicine Initiative and a lot of genomic medicine has been sort of promoted, sold, if you want to put it crassly, but true, I think true, as not only helping with rare diseases and not only helping with cancer, um, but also somehow is going to lead us to um, tackle our problems with chronic progressive diseases. And I think that's uh, an overstatement. And it's directing our sights away from the social and environmental factors that we absolutely need to pay attention to. And we don't spend anywhere near the same amount amount of money on those factors. Yeah, the, um, part of the sort of personal genomics um, industry right now is this language of empowerment and self-knowledge, which, um, you know, is, is, is both really exciting, like, you know, understanding more about yourself, you can make changes in the way you live, and you would be able to have a better life. Um, and also, I think, puts people in a very tough position where, you know, if you know something about yourself, then you're responsible for making that change. And so one of the, there was a piece of research recently coming out of the UK looking at um, people actually who have a, a genetic um, marker for diabetes risk, just like Francis Collins has, and um, how many of them have been successful in changing their lifestyle after learning this information. And anybody who's read the calorie count on food will probably know that like, the answer is nobody, most people don't make changes. So <laughs> it's not because we're not um, smart, it's not because we don't understand, it's because making lifestyle changes is much harder than just knowing something. So. Um, it you know, would be a pity to fail to actually figure out how to help people make lifestyle changes um, and just be like, well, you know this and therefore you're empowered and why aren't you changing your lifestyle? So that, that's where I think some of the sort of 
um, the sobering needs to kind of hurt. So this leads me to a little uh, preview, if you will, of the third episode, which looks at genetic testing. So I'm sure all of you during the Olympics say if you watch some of those ads always for 23 and May, and um, <laughs> you know there's a huge push uh, to get people not only through their doctors but as consumers to have their genomes tested. And um, just this week, a, a study came out showing that 40% of these direct-to-consumer things are wrong. So I'm curious, uh, either of you can jump in here. What you, what you want people to know or think about before they decide to have their genes tested. I mean, I did something I want people to know or think about is that, um, so, you know, initially 23andMe was selling their um, tests for a lot more conditions and or uh, traits than they currently are right now. So, like, it was 100 and something, and now I think it's 28 or something like that, that they're returning because the FDA said to them, you know, if you're going to tell people that you have, they have a trait for X condition, you know, we need to know that you're doing that based on good information. And so they just submit that information. Um, and yet, at the same time, these studies have shown that maybe people, they're, they're not always as accurate as they, as they said. And so, it's just so important that people have um, understand that you're being, in a way, sold something that sounds fun or empowering and could actually be very confusing and distressing and could lead you to have like test further testing and maybe even follow up care that may not be necessary. So it's, um, I don't know how to stop it because I feel like the rhetoric of self knowledge is so strong. And the idea that your genes belong to you and you ought to know about them, not just you, but you should know about them of your child as well, and it's your responsibility to do that. Um, that it's very hard to dial that back a little bit, but certainly um, this kind of information that shows the complexity will be one of the only antidotes that we have to kind of that. The only thing I would add that I would want people to know is that 40% false positives means that this technology is entering the marketplace with no barriers for requiring effectiveness or clinical validity. And some of that, some of what we can do is at the level of the consumer, get being a smarter consumer. But the real answer to this is that the United States has no technology assessment capacity. And we've chosen over and over again not to fund technology assessment. The, there has been so much pushback um, from industry to do that, and, that, and there's such a trend away from regulation that we can't do the kind of assessment we, that needs to be done before these products, which is really what they are, enters, enters the marketplace. And you know, in the UK, there's uh, a clinical effectiveness institution called NICE, and that is actually a, a pilloried by commentators here. So. When I think about messages for journalists, it's to recognize the um, great negativity that's framed around clinical effectiveness and research and something that we really should be supporting rather than running from. And over and over again, we're seeing, especially now, the stripping away of regulation. So I don't know if you've been reading about right to try laws, but um, that's an end run around the FDA, an opportunity to, again, have things enter the marketplace before they are known to be effective. And it's just one more example of how we have to have a collective response to this, as well as individuals deciding whether they're going to uh, take 23 and means results or not to heart for themselves. We need to have some kind of collective response. I did just want to add a little note, just that 23 and me has actually worked with the FDA and <coughs> doing a pretty responsible job, but there are so many other people out there. I feel like they always get mentioned. and. I just don't want to vilify them completely. Um, <laughs> they participate in our projects too, so we yeah, you know. I mean, they're friendly. But the other thing, you know, um, in the uh, in all of the episodes, we meet people like Alex Din who have rare diseases, or Ashanti, or a person whose life was saved by genetic testing. And you know, for the rare disease person, the genomic revolution has been amazing. Um, and so then, when you look and you say, okay, well, are we, and, and I want to get to CRISPR, so this is the last question on the first episode, but, um, you know, are we extrapolating too much from the success that genomics has had for these few people with these very rare things to have all of us expecting that, oh, I'm going to find out I have the gene for X or the gene for Y. I mean, yes, they might have something they could get their lifestyle changed for, but are they even really going to? 
be able to get any kind of actionable information. <laughs> well, a lot of the information that people get is about small increases in risk, which you know is hard to hard to act on, or it might not be wise to act on. Small increases in risk um, and could cause a lot of worry, you know, about it at the same time. So I certainly for a lot of the common diseases that they kept mentioning, you know, in the in two thousand, so Alzheimer's. Diabetes, um, hypertension, um, those are, we know already that those are complex diseases that have environmental and genetic factors interacting over time, and so we wouldn't be expecting that kind of one gene, one disease kind of model to work for that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I would think we would just, it's so hard to um, understand, I think, that you can have a gene that causes a disease, and if you have that gene, you will get it, like Huntington's. If have it, you will get it, and the only question is, you know, when exactly? And um, and then to think that the same kinds of science about genetics can also tell us that you may have a three three percent increased risk or something. Like that. There are six hundred known genes that impact schizophrenia, and they only collectively explain eight percent of schizophrenia and heritability. Like, how to think that through? Like, it's hard for us to think like that. To think like that, give to have that kind of complexity in our, our minds about this area of science. It's just difficult, and so that's what the struggle I think must be. I want to just to get to this idea of uh, CRISPR uh, because there's been so much uh, written and discussed in the media, not all of it very nuanced, um, as you saw in the film. It's going to eliminate chemotherapy, who knew? Um, and, but anyway, some of the coverage has been very helpful, some of it's terrifying, some of it's frivolous. Um, so, how would you like us to be, us not as journalists, but as consumers of information and as potential patients, how would you like us to look at this uh, upcoming technology? I'll take a stab and then I'll pass the mic. Um, there was a very, very good report and, uh, from the National Academy of Medicine on human genome modification this past winter, and some people involved in that are in the room. Um, and it navigates in response to your question, because there's a lot of um, excitement about the ability to do human gene editing around really serious diseases like we have been talking about. Um, it particularly, especially if it can be done in somatic cells, that is in cells that are not, not sperm, not eggs, not embryos, so that the changes are not heritable. And that's, I think, something certainly I would feel really excited about. Like Pierce. Like with Pierce, yes, exactly. Um, and this report from the, the Academy also then distinguished between um, inheritable changes, changes that we make in sperm or egg or embryo that will continue and are permanent. And there, they taught, they opened the door to um, doing that for particular diseases for which there is no alternative, and they identified about 10 caveats that would all have to be met. So approaching this with a great deal of um, caution, but not closing that door, and that would be a big change. The area that I think is most troubling um, is the area of enhancement, like that try to make ourselves better than well. And Part of the problem is that it's difficult to draw a line between what is a treatment and what is an enhancement. If we could have a clear line, maybe we could, you know, we could draw it and keep to it. But it's difficult to distinguish. So, for example, one of the most promising changes that's happening right now is research on um, on a muscular dystrophy on, on uh, Duchenne's uh, Duchenne's, and that could be very exciting. But the same gene that they've discovered and the remedies for that could also be used by athletes to strengthen their own muscle strength. So as we open this door, we could try to keep a, str you know, a, a strict line, but in practice, the very same interventions and therapies could be used for multiple purposes. So I think we have a lot to think through. The Hastings Center has a project that Josie is co-directing, um, which has just completed a, a manuscript called Human Flourishing in the Age of Gene Editing that's looking at some of the things we should be concerned about now that we have the power to make these kinds of heritable changes. 
So I, my answer to your question is that I, I think that the question is how should we be thinking about this technology? I think that's like exactly the right question. And um, the way I see it mainly is it's a platform technology. So sometimes people ask me if I'm for or against gene, gene editing. I'm like, I don't know, you're for or against electricity? Or, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's something that can be used in so many different ways. And so it's used constantly all around here. And on, in Manhattan Island, there are scientists using gene editing, CRISPR, to change the genes in insects and animals and cells and their research it's got enormously like huge pickup in labs um, and it's just such a long distance then to like say well that tells us anything about how we use it in people and how you might use it um, in future people so there's just a huge it's like can be used in so many different ways that it really is a incumbent upon us to do the work to think through the different uses and not think that because it's good in one context it's necessarily good in another. Again, it's the kind of cognitive work that human beings shy away from. It's like, I want to know if it's good or bad and I'm telling you that it might be good sometimes and it might not be good other times and that's, and it's going to be complicated to think it through. And it's, I mean, that's the sort of bad news. But Jennifer Downer, who was in, popped up, I can't remember if it was the first or second one, when she talked, oh, second, the second one when she talked about CRISPR, She's done this, I think, really brave and amazing thing, which is that she right out of the gate said, we have to all be talking about this. I've co-created this technology. It's amazingly exciting. I think it's, well, she obviously thinks it's huge, and she has nightmares about it. She is, she publicly will talk about what she's worried about. She's called for an international conversation about it. She's not, you know, she didn't say, it's just the scientists will figure it out, leave us alone. She's the opposite of that. And that's a really impressive and really important step for a new technology, so that's exactly what has to happen, that kind of conversation. And I would just add a last note about that, which is that when you look at how we, as a, as a public, look at gene therapy, I just hope we don't do the same thing with CRISPR, that we give the scientists a chance mm -hmm. to do whatever it is they're gonna do before we, you know, overly imagine where it's, where it's heading. Anyway, uh, I think we're going to allow some of you to ask questions. And um, so I think what I'll do is I'll give. Oh, all right. I was <laughs> anyway, so. Um, Would you hands. comment on uh, Did Jimmy Carter have the gene therapy to uh, cure his. Uh, if he had cancer, is that right? Yeah, no, he got a drug called Keytruda, which is a targeted drug. So in the first episode, you, you see the drug that's targeted to the gene. So no, that's not a gene therapy. Gene therapy, they either send a gene into your body or <coughs> take your blood out like they did with Ashanti, you know, put a new gene in and send it back in. Um, given, given the demographic here, can you talk a little bit about why um, Alzheimer's seems to be more like diabetes in terms of gene therapy? Um, <laughs> and where, you know, where gene therapy has a role or no role at all? Uh, based on what we know today. Based on what we know today, I don't think it has any role at all. I mean, there, you would have to find a gene that was, and, and, and when I say this, one thing that you need to know is, like with Alex, who has, you know, a kind of kidney cancer that affects a very tiny number of people, it could turn out that there might be a gene for Alzheimer's in a very tiny percentage of the population, and we haven't found it yet, and perhaps someday down the road, one of these kinds of, you know, either gene therapy or a drug could be available. But as of right now, nobody's identified any gene that directly causes somebody to have Alzheimer's. <coughs> I can't see. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't want to. Uh, spoiler alert for, for episode three, but do you get into um, to mental illnesses and what is known about uh, genetic? We don't. Yeah. <laughs> Part four. <laughs> yeah, not long ago, NPR um, Anamidi did a piece on the dilution of the idea, the dilution of the idea of breakthrough, the term breakthrough. And uh, I think it was in the piece that we had this hope, we had this decay curve, a dissolution. <laughs> so, uh, how do we reach some universal agreement? Of what is a true breakthrough? How do scientists view that? Is there any discipline we can have around that? Well, I, I, I mean, I think that is the language that is the marketing language. You know, I mean, th this has been talked about first as personalized medicine, then as precision medicine. We have several articles in the Hastings Center report 
that um, actually closely looked at the language and narrative that was told as the, um, this technology, as these breakthroughs were being anticipated and envisioned, um, and as Congress was being um, encouraged to raise the NIH's budget. So I don't. I think we, there's a lot of language here that's problematic. Breakthrough is one of them, but another one is all the military metaphors. So I, I actually noticed that this time, I watched this a couple times, but I, somebody said, Jill, who was it that said, um, in the very beginning, someone said, precision medicine, a heat-seeking missile. <laughs> <laughs> and, and often you'll see that there's military metaphors, we're going to attack this. So thank you for bringing that up. I think it's something that is endemic to how we're, how we're um, trying to raise funds for science. I mean, I, I actually think CRISPR is a scientific breakthrough. Um, like, I don't think it's, it's not hyped in that way, but I spent some time with a, um, a, CRISP, a CRISPR using scientist um, at Rockefeller University working with mosquitoes and um, sort of was like, what was it like when CRISPR first came out? Because they were using um, a whole a different technology to make changes in their mosquitoes and it would take a long time to do. It was kind of labor intensive. And he's like, oh, it's just like way quicker and we get to learn it and then we can just carry on doing it but much more quickly. <laughs> like, oh, you weren't like, your mind wasn't blown. He's like, oh, that was really helpful, you know. So, it, so it's like, it's not, but then there was other scientists who could not make an animal model for their disease until CRISPR. So, it is a really huge breakthrough, I think. It's absolutely the right way to think about it, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just that what you didn't expect that means for like your own health is, I think, where there's this massive translation here. Yes. So if you could maybe comment a little bit <coughs> along the same lines of what you've been talking about, the, the complexity of epigenetics and gene regulatory networks, things getting switched on and off by the environment, interactions with our own microbiome, and the fact that it's so much more complicated since we only have a 4% difference in our genes with chimps, but we're so wildly different. Um, it maybe you can say a little bit about that, because one of the things that concerns me is the oversimplification that could take place from a pre-existing condition perspective, mm -hmm. whereas the actual interactions are so much more complicated. If you could maybe talk about that a little bit. It sounds more like you could talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I thought it was amazing that Francis Collins, on the second time around, talked about genes and the environment. I've actually, for years, never heard him say that. So he's taking notice of the science that you're talking about. It is so much more complicated than we thought in 2000. Um, it's not just that these diseases don't have one gene, there's 82 genes for something, but, but also that the genes interact with the genes, the genes interact with proteins, the environment affects the way the genes interact with the genes. It's incredibly complicated. It's exciting science, and I'm glad that Francis Collins is kind of now acknowledging that this is a very, very complicated um, story. Do you want to add something? <laughs> because I think you might, yeah, because you, you know the science. Uh, I can't see exactly, but yeah. I suspect that you're a scientist. Um, sort of, yeah. So it's, it's, it's just that, you know, even the idea that there are so many non-human cells that make up humans, mm. and many of the interactions that are discovered now are actually between our gene network, our other biology, and the organisms that occupy and share a symbiotic relationship with our bodies. In our and, microbiome. In our microbiome. On our skin, in our skin, and it's, it's, it's fascinating that your gut flora, for example, communicates with your brain through your vagus nerve, you know, and that your fat then you know, sends out signals that affect all these other things. And it really does feel a little oversimplified to think that a single isolated gene, except in very unusual conditions, is going to spell the whole story. I just want to say that that's what they're hope was, not all of that, but some of that is what they're going to try to do with the Precision Medicine Initiative, and we didn't get into a long explanation of it, but all of the participants' medical records are going to be included, you know, they're going to fill out surveys about their lifestyle, about how they eat, about what kind of exercise, I mean, they're going to take all of that information and combine it with the genomic information, you know, to try to figure out how these things interact, and um, thanks to 
you know, massive computing technology. They hope to, you know, find out some of those things. I honestly don't know if the microbiome is included. Not yet, but it will be. So uh, I, I was joking with my colleagues that we used to have an oh god model, one gene, one disease, now we have a mid which is many genes, many environments, and interaction over time, maybe that needs to be my <laughs> But it makes some, it just raises a question, a little bit of a question for me about whether it's always the right level at which to read the book. So the letter by letter, even looking at the texture of the paper that the story is written on, is is it is it necessarily the right place or the only place to be looking at the story? And so, you know, it may be just that point about that the, the epidemiologist made about, like, we know a lot of things that make people healthy and we're not doing them. You know, I mean, I've lived in the United States for 15 years, but I know I still sound like a foreigner to you, but like, <laughs> people are, you know, we know what makes people have healthy lives generally, already. Good education, non-violent neighborhoods, you know, um, support, like preventative care, nutrition, like, there's so much that's already known and so little that's been done. And some of this is just a distraction from that. So one little trivial pursuit fact before I hand the microphone to this lady. Um, the actual CRISPR technology was borrowed from bacteria that already do this. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I just would like to know if you think that there would be fewer metaphors of heat-seeking missiles if more women were in the battle. <laughs> that one was a woman. I hate to tell you, that one was a woman. <laughs> interesting. Well, interesting. But, but, you know, we were watching mostly men talk, and there was a huge competition. And uh, not to say that women can't be competitive and shouldn't be competitive. But uh, I look forward to more women in my well, Episode three. Uh, excellent. Excellent. I'm very scientist, and episode three is female. Excellent. So um, thank you very much. You're welcome. I've got one for you. <clears throat> I think there was an allusion to the fact that uh, athlete, athletic abuse of this technology may be in our future. Will there be a way to detect it? Mm -hmm. I actually. Don't care about sports. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but other people, it's because so many other people do, I don't need to. It's such a, it's a burden that has been lifted from my shoulders. Um, so I, there are people who know the answer to that, right? And I'm guessing the answer is no. But they don't know. Uh, you mean pre and pro, pre yeah. and post data? Yeah, I'm not sure, I don't think we know yet how enhancement of our children. You started a designer baby question a while back, Jill. I don't think we yet know exactly how that would happen, but it is true that with CRISPR, it, it's, it, it's really clear now that we're getting closer to being able to choose lots of things about the kind of baby that we want, especially if we're using um, IVF and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and that um, even not only athletic uh, privileging of athletic talent, but there's even been discussion of could we make ourselves more morally attuned, more empathic, less impulsive, um, and certainly cognitive enhancements and memory enhancements. So it's, it's uh, still a future, but not, not that far into the future. And I do think we should start thinking about some of the consequences of that now, not later. I do want to add, though, that they're going to have to figure out what gene causes what. And since we don't know that for the vast majority of our human traits, in order for them to do these enhancements, they'd have to know what to edit or what to tinker with. That's so like small, small increments, basically. Yeah, so, so, you know. Anybody else? Yeah, so playing off something you mentioned earlier, the genome itself was something that really accelerated bio biology research, but it wasn't sold as such. And as we saw in this film, the scientists themselves were the worst practitioners of hiding it for what it wasn't. How do we convince them that they can interest the public in things that aren't being oversold? So I had a fascinating conversation, and because you can't include everything, um, so Aristides Petrinos, who appears in the first episode, was one of the people who really helped design the Human Genome Project, and I asked him this question. I 
and he said, look, we first got interested in sequencing the human genome because we were studying the effects of the atom bomb. You know, uh, people didn't expect the atom bomb to have the kinds of health effects that it had, and so they were trying to figure out, well, how can you study the effects of a nuclear bomb without testing on people, which of course would be really immoral. And so they got this idea that they would try, you know, sequencing genes and, you know, the whole idea of sequencing the human genome had nothing to do with what you've just seen. And, and so selling Congress on the health benefits became, you know, Marston Lenihan and people like him were doing their research at the same time. And so they all just sort of joined forces. And originally the biologists didn't want the Human Genome Project to happen because they thought it was ironically going to take too much money away from health research. <laughs> um, the answer is that they don't really believe that Congress and the American people will fund anything unless it's going to cure everyone. And they might not be wrong. You know, I, I personally have not uh, enough experience in politics to know, but that is unfortunately what a lot of them believe. People might be interested to know that Nigel Kenneth wrote a piece that was published in JAMA that was called What to Do When Big, when, uh, big Underperforming Ideas Get Entrenched. <laughs> <laughs> and his worry was exactly this, that NIH it, it does not fund big, you know, big sky, what he called big sky discovery anymore, and that over 50% of what they do fund is directly related to genomics, leaving a lot less for any of the other areas. Any more questions? Okay, well, I want to thank the panel. five years and what we're going to do. Um, and this is somewhat of a first for us, and I hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope you come to the next one. Thank you.